Oh, good morning, everybody, and welcome on this very wet and cold Valentine's Day. As I feel I'm still in reception class of the uh, Caulfield Baptist, I was very surprised when Sarah asked me to do the welcome today. Are you sure, I said. Well, she wouldn't have asked me if she didn't think I could do it. <gasps> what have I done? Well, anyway, I, when I put the phone down, I could hear some loud singing. And it was the hymn. It was God is working his purpose out. I hadn't heard that for a long time. I used to sing it when I lived in Norfolk. Well, wow, purpose. What was purpose? Ever wonder why we have failed to find life on other planets? Yes, ours is designed to sustain and meet most of our basic needs. Do you think it's just coincidence? No, not according to the Bible. In it, God said, I made the earth and created mankind upon it. Did you know that if the earth was 10% larger or 10% smaller, life as we know it wouldn't just be possible? Or that we're just the right distance from the sun so that we can receive the right amount of heat and light. Any further away and we'd freeze, any closer and we wouldn't be able to survive. Consider for a moment the amazing tilt of the axis of the Earth. None of the other planets are tilted like ours at 23 degrees. This angle allows our sun's rays to touch every part of Earth's surface over the course of a year. Like excited people getting ready their first home, God made this Earth specifically for us. For this is what the Lord says, He who created the heavens, He is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be habitated, inhabited. That's how much he cares for us. So why is he allowed coronavirus? I'm sure that we've all wrapped our brains over this for this very long year. What's the purpose of all this? When God took all that trouble to create our world, why all this darkness and despair? Perhaps our world needs a shake up. Is it moving in the wrong direction? What is the purpose? Some of us may want to brainstorm ourselves. How different am I? when I'm locked down. I wear a mask and I continually have to wash my hands and I distance myself. Have my attitudes and actions changed during this time? A pen and paper and I quickly brainstormed myself yesterday morning. First of all, I counted my blessings. I'm warm and I've got food. But I couldn't go out and I had to obey government orders. And I'm not definitely not going to have a holiday. It made me aware of others' needs. I miss my family. But there is the importance of a community, a caring community. And the air is a bit cleaner. People are working from home, I've noticed, but there are redundancies and poverty, so much of it, and lots more. But people are volunteering, so much grief. Children are missing their school friends. And there are so many exhausted, 
NHS folk, and the list goes on. Is God making us aware of all these things that we took for granted? What does he want us to do? How will our future be? What is the purpose of this terrible virus? Perhaps during the day or the week, you may make yourself a list and ponder over it. What has and what is the purpose of this terrible virus? Amen. Thank you. And now we will sing our first song. God is making his purpose. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you very much. Well, I'm so sorry, that suddenly stopped working. That was a wonderful reflection. Thank you very much, Pauline. And I'm really sorry that I'm not able to, to show the, um, to sing the song. I, I can only apologize. It was working before the service and now it's not working at all. It won't even open up. It's trying to close down and open up both at the same time. Pauline challenged us to reflect on what God's purpose is. Now, if you've got the um, church, magazine, um, church newsletter this week, then you will have seen on the back page what Christians together in Bristol have been doing during the course of this lockdown. I've got a little video, if that's going to show, if that's going to play, I've got a little video which encourages us because during this time of lockdown, Christians in Bristol have been working together. It's been a wonderful witness for God that Christians can and do and will work together. So let's see if we can have a look at this video. And if you get the newsletter, have a look on what's on the back page. See if there's something that you would like to join in with. Let's have a look at this video. And action. Get down, look at this camera. Together, we helped families to feel less isolated and more connected. Together, we're in every community in our city. Together, we recognised that mental and emotional health was something of a new wave that was coming. 
Together we provided leadership and coordination and momentum for our uh, response effort in the community. We were able to find people who could step in to keeping children safe through fostering. With COVID-19, there was so much happening above the surface, but below the surface, all struggling with our mental and emotional health. Even if we don't suffer with anxiety, these are anxious times. There's been a lot of loss, disappointment. Together, we as food banks fed over 20,000 people during COVID. Of those, around half were children. For us, that was a 300% increase in number of children that we were feeding during COVID. In Noel West, we currently don't have access to a supermarket and there is no local food bank provision. 11% of local people are reported to live in moderate to severe food insecurity. We needed to respond in the COVID crisis. Home for Good believes that together we can find a home for good for every child who needs one. Together we can make sure that no one in Bristol in this next season goes without food. Together we will build a community that's really strong, really resilient and that everybody wants to live in. Together, by supporting each other, we can build a positive mental health culture in Bristol. Together we can learn that it's okay not to be okay. It feels to me that we're standing on the edge of something amazing, actually, in this city. We really could build on those connections. As the church, we're God's people. That means we have the responsibility and the privilege of carrying his heart and his agenda for our city at this time. Together, we can make a difference. Makes you think, doesn't it, when we act together? I believe we have Amanda in the room now. So, Amanda, are you able to unmute yourself and bring us the reading for today? Yeah. This morning's reading is John chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come into the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come into the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Thank you, Amanda. <coughs> Esther's going to bring us our prayers this morning. Should we pray together? Dear Father God, you give us gifts every day. Even this opportunity to pray with you now is a gift from you. Thank you. You love us. Father, this is the glorious, victorious message of the Bible. This is the greatest gift each of us will ever receive. Thankfully, your gift is not a message of just words, but you put your message of love for each of us into action. When you paid a huge price for us by giving us your son, Jesus, you love us. You never wanted us to perish, to be lost, and therefore you rescued us with the power of your love. You fill the heart-shaped hole in our souls. You complete us. You sacrificed your son, your only precious son, so that we could have life. We thank you that your son Jesus went to die on the cross for our sins that he paid the price for putting ourselves before you, putting our desires before yours. How can we ever thank you enough? You love us. Help us, Father, to never doubt your love. Protect us from the evil of this life that would rob us of this truth. The truth that gives us life, life in all its fullness. Help us to be as you intended us to be, in relationship with you and to be reflectors of you in this world. As you love us, may we come to you and accept your gift of a fresh start, a clean slate, new beginnings, to be born again. We confess that we cannot fully understand your love, but we do thank you and we praise you with all our hearts. Please forgive us when our lives do not reflect your love in the way we view you ourselves, each other, and your world. Lord, we ask that you fill us with your spirit. Change us in such a way that no one could tell where you end and where we begin. We ask you to help us to remain in you. May you be the inspiration and the power for every move we make. May we become people who love because you first loved us. You love us. 
And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Esther. We're going to worship. We're going to sing a couple of songs which remind us of God's love for us. Let's worship him. <laughs> and this is a different application. The other one crashed. So let's hope this music works. But um, hopefully we're going to sing of God's love for us and our love in return for him. Let's worship. love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away wounds which mother chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man I know I 
I still make mistakes, but you have new mercies for me every day. Cause your love never fails. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me. Your love never fails The wind is strong and the water's deep But I'm not alone here in these open seas Cause your love never fails is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side But your love never fails You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails Together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. Stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Well, God's always a surprise, isn't he? So the application that didn't work two weeks ago is now working fine, and the application that has been working fine until now is not working. Those who've contributed to our service so far have challenged us to see God's love on this day of romantic love, Valentine's Day. It's a secular idea, but it's an opportunity to look again at what it means to love. We've sung in our worship, or we've at least tried to sing our first song, but we've sung in our worship about God's love for us. To be honest, I'm as uncomfortable with Valentine's Day as I am with Mother's Day or Father's Day. Not all of us have a partner. Not all of us in a happy, are in a happy relationship. And just as Mother's Day is the most painful day of the year for some, as Christians, we have a duty to not be swayed by cultural norms and a responsibility to seek out those who are most hurt by this well-meaning but thoughtless celebration of all things to do with romantic love. For God so loved the world 
said our reading. But there's a challenge to loving. This week has once again seen footballers and referees racially abused online with death threats posted on social media. So what does the Bible say about love? And how do we love? And where do we love? And who do we love? Well, unlike our rather limited language, in the Bible, there are four different words in the New Testament, which are used, which are translated as love. And you may know this. There is philia love, which is brotherly love or sisterly love, fraternal love. There's agape, which is self-sacrificial love. Love. There's eros love, which is romantic or sexual love. And the storge love, love such as between a parent and a child. And the Bible differentiates between all these different types of love, whereas we use a blanket term which covers them all. Philia love and agape love are the words that we find in the New Testament. Bro love, love for a brother or sister, a self-sacrificial type of love. But we find a negative form of storge love, astorge, the love between a brother, a parent and a child, twice in the New Testament. In Paul's letter, second letter, letter to Timothy, it's used to describe the mark of the terrible end times when people will lack the natural love for their own families. Have we seen this? This week in a tweet, the DU, there was a DUP MP complaining in a sarcastic tone that everyone on Songs of Praise last Sunday, when the final of Gospel Singer of the Year was broadcast, was black. In Romans 12, we read, be devoted to one another in love, honour one another above yourselves. Now, the word translated as be devoted to is an amalgamation of philia love and storge love. So love for our brothers and sisters and the same sort of love that we have for, for between a parent and a child. Family love. It means cherish one's kindred. This is love. Cherishing our brothers and sisters, our families and friends. And perhaps we find that doubly difficult when we're already constrained and tested by our current situation. Agape is the word most used in the New Testament to mean love. Love which involves faithfulness, willful delight in the object of love. It has a lofty character which we read about in 1 Corinthians 13. Yes, that passage so often used at weddings is not about romantic love, but about self-sacrificial love. I wonder how many couples have realized this and chosen it deliberately, and how many choose it in ignorance. Agape, when used in the New Testament, is always, always, almost always used to describe the love of and the love from God, whose very nature is love. Valentine's Day is a day focused on eros love, romantic love. The one word for love that we don't find in the New Testament. And it ex excludes so many, as it's only one tiny portion of what love is really about. So what is love? We say God loves us. Is that more than just a warm and comfortable, comforting feeling? A boost to our self-worth to know that we are cherished? When the rich young man came to Jesus to ask, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? He thought himself to be already righteous. Jesus reminds him of what he must do. And the young man says, this I've done. And then the Bible tells us something extraordinary, that, but, that Jesus looks at him and loves him. There's that pause in the story, storytelling. We think we know where the trajectory, the line of the story is going. And Jesus stops and looks at the young man and he loves him. Because he knows that the young man relies on his wealth 
and the power that affords him to make his way in the world. And so he challenges the young man to sell everything he has and give to the poor. Jesus looks on the world. Jesus looks on us and he loves us just as Esther said, God loves us in our prayers this morning. Not with romantic love, with filia love, with storge love. He loves God's children. And here, in the scripture that Amanda read for us this morning, Jesus loves Nicodemus so much that he introduces him to the Holy Spirit. Is this strategic? Nicodemus is a priest. So Jesus chides him for not knowing about the Holy Spirit. Are you a teacher of Israel, he says, and yet you don't know him? He's modeling the love of his father to Nicodemus by loving him so much that he includes him. He is inviting this influential man to love others and include them. We read in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. Even those who hate us should be afforded that love. Even those whose faith or politics is different from us should be afforded that love. This is what Jesus models. Even those whose mental health means that they are difficult to deal with should be loved. This is how Jesus models God's love for us. In John's gospel account of the life of Jesus, the story of Jesus turning over the table, tables in the temples and uh, in the temple and driving out the money changers happens just before this account of the encounter with Nicodemus. It tells us something about the forces that may be at work here. Jesus has just upset the temple authorities. He's done more than that. He's made a whip of cords to drive out the money changers. Do you remember those stories of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, that we talked about and we sung about? Jesus has clearly been angry when they've challenged him to give them, give them a sign. Jesus has told them that he will rebuild this temple in three days. But it's important for us to see that his anger does not overwhelm him. God is love and Jesus is therefore love. So when Nicodemus comes to see him, his feelings towards this leader of the Jews, one of the people who has not objected to the growth of trade and commerce within the temple, is one of love, despite the fact that he's crept to Jesus at night so as not to be seen by others. Jesus knows that inviting the spirit in opens the door to another level of love, not our love, but the father's love, the capacity to love beyond our capacity to love. But let's pause because we need that capacity to love. Let's invite the Holy Spirit now. Father God, send your spirit on us. Help us to know that love, which is beyond our capacity to give. Perhaps in our times of reflection, which Pauline has encouraged us to, you may bring to mind those people that we find most difficult to love. Help us by your spirit living in us to love with your love and not our love. Help us to love with that limitless love that the Holy Spirit brings. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Jesus talks with Nicodemus, this man of the temple, this man who may feel very differently from himself, Jesus is amazingly candid. He's straightforward and direct. He clearly doesn't feel the need to dress up his message 
in allegory or parable. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. There's that word, if you're to read it in the original Greek, which I did, agape, self-sacrificial love. Those who do what is true come to the light so that their deeds may be seen by God. But why Nicodemus? Why tell him? Because everyone needs to hear the message of love from God. Do we not need to know that we're loved? Does our broken world not need to hear that it is loved? For many of us, a romantic gesture is not what we need or not what we will receive or be able to give, but we can share love, the love of God. Love means turning the other cheek. Love means taking up the cause of others and campaigning alongside them. We saw the video of the church leaders throughout Bristol and the things that they are doing in their community to share the love of God in very practical ways. Jesus said, to his followers and to us, a new command I give you, to love one another as I have loved you. This was a context in which hate could grow. The temple had been cleared, Jesus had challenged the Jews, but Nicodemus made the first move. But even if he hadn't, God's love for him would have been the same. Jesus' response to him would have been the same. The DUP politician, the haters on, Twitter's, on Twitter, of course, these are attitudes that we must challenge. But we must also search our hearts to be sure that the attitude in which we do this is not one of desiring to win the argument, win the day, take up our weapons and go into battle for a righteous cause in order to fight for the side where God is, because God doesn't take sides when it comes to his love. This was something that was not understood by the German army in World War I when they printed God with us on the buckles of the belts of the soldiers. God's heart breaks for the disenfranchised and abused, the abused. What we must try to get our heads around is that whilst God, God's heart breaks over the actions of the abusers, his love for them remains the same. And whatever we do to right the wrongs of so many centuries, however for we engage with changing our society and our personal attitudes, we must not do it because we hate those who claim supremacy or abuse authority or cause death and destruction or propagate hatred or engage with abuse, abuse, but because we love them with the love of God. This is the challenge of love. And Jesus showed us how to do that. Forgive them, Father, he said from the cross. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus even reminds God to be love in all situation. Agape love has its cost. It costs God his son. It costs when God forgives us our wrongdoings. God loved Herod when he slaughtered the innocent children in an effort to find the child who was a threat to his claim to be God's chosen one, but God didn't love his actions or accept his behavior. God loved the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes and the temple authorities who made themselves the center of the worship of God, who built authority and power into their st structures and met the challenge of the arrival of Jesus with denial and deceit and plotting. He didn't love their behavior or accept their actions. The challenge for us is to act at all times in love for one another, not just towards our brothers and sisters in Christ, but to act towards our enemies in love. To meet our abusers and attackers in love, not putting ourselves in harm's way by staying with an abusive partner, not loving their actions or their behavior, but seeking changes because of our love for them out of that fount of bottomless love that we have access to because we have the Holy Spirit in us. 
In these times when we see terrible behavior around us, when we feel passionately about justice and equity for all, when we, we may even be subject to abuse ourselves, we absolutely should not, should seek to change culture, attitudes, situations. We must be a radical people living a radical life of witness to our world. But our motivating factor must be love, philia love. Agape, love. Love costs. And as Christians, we must sometimes bear that cost. God's love extends to the whole world. And Jesus made atonement on the cross for the sins of the whole world. Valentine's Day is really hurtful for those who don't have a romantic par partner. We must challenge our society. We must be countercultural. There is such a thing of, as love, and real love is not to be found just in romantic love, but in the love of the Father for his children. When God's love fills us, we can't keep it in. We have to let it out. This week sees the beginning of Lent. Traditionally, we take something away. We stop eating biscuits, or we stop drinking alcohol if we usually drink alcohol, or we cut down on, on chocolate. How about adding something this year? Something like love. How about intentionally loving someone who doesn't love you back? How about praying in love for those who would spread racial abuse or promote gender bias? How about responding in love every day to the frustrations that we face? God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that those who believe in him should not perish. Let's worship.
death has been defeated and he reigns ruler of the heavens and his name is Jesus the Messiah for he made us away by which we have been saved he's the savior My apologies that we didn't get to sing the first hymn. I've been trying all the way through to um, close down the app and reopen it, but it won't even close. Um, so I'm sorry about that. But let's pray as we end our service. Just as God's word was sent into the world to heal and redeem, so God sends you into the world this day to be light and love, healing and hope. Go to be the light of, for the world. And may the grace and peace of God the creator, the redeemer and the sustainer come upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Our service is ended. <laughs>